Today's case is a wild one and I need to give you a bunch of trigger warnings because it does involve children. Now it's the beginning of a game. Seven ominous words, two bodies, one confession, and a killer. Only 14 years with a self-proclaimed darkness that threatened the lives of many around him. But how many would be harmed before authorities caught up with him? And how much destruction would be left in his wake? This is the story of the Kobe child murders. I'm Stephanie Moram and this is Wicked Ever After. Please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel or my podcast if that's where you're listening. And if you appreciate this episode, hit the like button. I do appreciate all the support that you can offer. And it's because of you that I'm able to continue creating content. So thank you. And lastly, I just want to mention my Invisalign. Um, I might have some difficulty pronouncing some words, so I apologize in advance. Kobe is a city in Japan with a population of around 1.5 million. It is Japan's seventh largest city and the third largest port city after Tokyo and Yokohama. Wedged between the coast and the mountains, Kobe is the biggest container port in the region. It's here that we find our two victims, Ayakea Yamashia, age 10, and June Hase, aged 11. On May 27, 1997, the head of June Hase was found at the school gate a mere hours before students were set to arrive. His head had been severed with a handsaw and other mutilations had occurred to his body. I think I need to take a minute to pause there. That was super heavy. Stuffed in his mouth was a note written in red ink. It said, this is the beginning of the game. You police guys, stop me if you can. I desperately want to see people die. It is a thrill for me to commit murder. A bloody judgment is needed for my years of great bitterness. The author of the note identified himself as Sake Ki Bara. Police felt the letters and the killings were reminiscent of the Zodiac Killer from San Francisco in the 1960s and worried they had a copycat on their hands. About a week later, on June 6th, the local newspaper received a letter from Saito, where he claimed responsibility for the slaying and cutting off of Jun Hase's head. He also threatened that more killings would follow if he wasn't caught. A second letter soon followed, arriving in a brown envelope with no return address or name. Inside was another 1,400 word warning, also written in red ink. In it, He had included a six-character name that was pronounced Seito Sakai Kibara. Ironically enough, these characters also mean alcohol, devil, rose, saint, and fight. This name was used not just in these letters, but also in the note that was stuffed in June's mouth, seemingly tying them all together. The letter stated, Now, it's the beginning of a game. I'm putting my life at stake for the sake of the game. If I'm caught, I'll probably be hanged. Police should be angrier and more determined in pursuing me. It's only when I kill that I'm liberated from the constant hatred that I suffered and that I'm able to attain peace. It is only when I give pain to people that I can ease my own pain. The letter also lashed out against the Japanese educational system calling it mandatory education that formed me an invisible person. In the rush and panic to report the updates and latest developments in this case, the Japanese media misreported the name as Onibara, which means Demon's Rose, though the killer does insist he gave the correct name. Irritated and angry about the mess up, Sato later wrote to the news station, From now on, if you misread my name or spoil my mood, I will kill three vegetables a week. If you think I can only kill children, you're greatly mistaken. A few weeks later, on June 28th, a 14-year-old junior high school student was arrested as a suspect in the murder of June Hase. Because he was a juvenile, a name was not released and he was referred to as Boy A. Shortly after his arrest, he confessed to the murder of 10-year-old Ayakea 
Yamashika on March 16th, as well as the assaults of three other girls on or around the same date. So how did we get here? And what was his hatred and pain that seemed to course so strongly through a child's veins that he was desperate and driven to kill? Saito Sakakiya Bera is the alias for Boy A. But during media reports and other events, the name Shinshi Shiro Asuma was given as the real identity of the boy. So to make things less confusing and easier for me to pronounce, if I'm going to be honest, we're going to refer to the serial killer as Sato or Boy A for the rest of this episode. Sato was born on July 7th, 1982. And as he grew older, he quickly began getting negative attention from neighbors. He was often seen carrying cutting weapons in and outside of school and seemed to have a fascination with death, a fascination that only seemed to increase after the death of his grandmother. Beyond that, not much was ever reported about his family or early childhood. However, in June 2015, Saito published an autobiography book titled Zeka that outlined his life and murders in gruesome details, also stating his regret and apology for the crimes he committed. Despite the nature of the book, it was still allowed to be published and sold, and millions bought their own copy. From that book, we learn a few more details about his early life and what might have led him to murder. Saito grew up in a traditional Japanese family with very strict customs and standards. Those that attended elementary school with him described him as being bright and popular. But as he got older and entered junior high school, it's reported he became more isolated and introverted due to the pressure he was feeling about grades and achieving high academics. There isn't much documented about his parents, but in his own words, Saito makes very strong affection for his grandmother, well known. In one part, he writes, I have only one picture of my childhood. I disposed of all the other photos, but I couldn't let go of this one. My grandmother, in a black kimoto, sits in a massage chair. She places her left hand firmly on my chest and gently places my right hand on my right thigh so I don't slip off her knee. Later, he describes another incident with his grandmother where he was climbing up a tree in order to impress her. But... The higher he got, the more worried his grandmother became, crying out for him to come down before he got hurt. Realizing he was putting his grandmother in distress, Saito climbed down and ran to his grandmother, where he, she hugged him. He stated, My grandmother hugged me while crying. I felt I was loved. No matter what I do or don't, my grandmother loves me. In 1993, when Saito was in fifth grade, his grandmother passed away. On the day of her funeral, he entered his grandmother's bedroom and picked up her favorite massager. Another trigger warning, it's a little graphic. In front of the mortuary tablet, Sato took off the head of the massager and while staring at the photo of his grandmother, he began pleasuring himself. I deeply chased the illusion of my grandmother, her voice, her smell, her touch, tears, runny nose, and drool where they mixed. I felt that what I did was a filthy act. In front of my grandmother's tablet while staring at her deceased, I experienced it with one of her favorite relics while thinking of her. That was really hard to read and pretty gruesome, in my opinion. According to Sato, this behavior of grief, obsession, and pleasure continued for two more years. This is also when his fascination with death became even stronger and escalated. He claims that it started out with just wanting to understand death. So he first started dissecting slugs and frogs. At one point, he lined up numerous frogs in a row and then proceeded to run them over with his bicycle. It was then that he realized he liked killing. He then moved on to mutilating stray cats and killing pigeons. And each time he killed, he started to become sexually aroused by age 13 he had killed numerous animals and even confessed to his teacher that his favorite hobby was mutilating insects he started taking more and more weapons to school and started keeping a journal with his deepest thoughts one time he wrote 
I can ease my irritation when I'm holding a survival knife or spinning scissors like a pistol. The weapon seemed to calm his racing mind. At this time, he began a fascination with serial killers. Ted Bundy and the Zodiac Killer seemed to become his idols quickly. Instead of heading out with friends, he stayed up late studying the minds of serial killers at home and abroad. He also began to believe in a god called Bamoy Do Gishin, who according to him, protected him. No one has been able to figure out who this god was and where he might have come from, so it's unclear if Sato invented it or if there's some sort of origin somewhere. But regardless, he claimed that the scene at the school was a sacrificial ritual to this god. Bored with animals and feeling an impulse or something bigger, it was time to capture his biggest kill yet, humans. On February 10th, 1997, Sato bludgeoned two unidentified girls with a hammer. Both ended up surviving. A few weeks later, on March 15th, 1997, Sato hit 10-year-old Akaya Yamashika on the head from behind with a hammer. She would die 12 days later of head trauma. In his diary, he writes, I carried out sacred experiments today to confirm how fragile human beings are. I brought the hammer down when the girl tried to face me. I think I hit her a few times, but I was too excited to remember. The following week, on March 23rd, he added, This morning my mom told me, poor girl, the girl attacked seemed to have died. There's no sign of me being caught. I thank you, Bamoy Okishin, the god that he either created or I'm not sure where he came from, for this, please continue to protect me. It was later revealed that on the same day he attacked Akia, he attacked another girl with a knife, stabbing her in the stomach once before escaping unrecognized. She was released from the hospital two weeks later and survived. After hurting three victims and killing one, there are no reports of any victims until May 27th, when Saito spotted Jun Hase, a special needs student, wandering around the neighborhood. With a lust for murder and seeing an opportunity, Sato told June that he had spotted a turtle and lured him up a hill that he referred to in his book as the Chocolate Stairs. At the top of this hill, called Tank Mountain, there was a TV station and a heavily dense forested area next to it. That's where Sato led June. Once they were out of sight, Sato strangled June to death with a shoelace and then hid his body in the TV station facility for a little bit of time. Sato returned to his grandfather's house for tools before returning to the body a few hours later. That is when he took a handsaw to June's head, cut it off, and mutilated various other parts of his body. He stabbed his eyes with a knife and tore his eyeballs. He also tried to cut the tongue to keep as a souvenir, but rigor mortis had already set in and he was unsuccessful. He put the head in a bag and carried it home. Once home, he drank the blood that he had collected in the bag and spent time playing with it before pleasuring himself on it. He then cleaned it and continued to disfigure the head some more. About the incident, he wrote, my blood is dirty, so I thought that drinking a pure child's blood would cleanse the dirty blood. After the head was found at the school by the janitor, 150 police officers began patrolling the neighborhood. That was also really fucking hard to read. On June 28, 1997, Sato Boy A was arrested after the police conducted some handwriting comparisons and received help from the girl that survived the knife attack. After his arrest, they found his diary in his room where all his recounts of the murders were etched in ink. After this arrest, he led the police to the location on Tank Mountain where the headless boy of June lay. Relieved that he was arrested, Sato was grateful he would finally be put to death, having written about how only his own death would give him salvation. However, because he was a minor, the law did not allow him to be put to death, much to Sato's dismay. The only salvation for me was the death penalty, a life-threatening game without a reset button. If you lose, you will be hanged. I will suffer the same as June, who I have taken and will die. 
For me, that was the only ending. Fear spreads all over the body like a drop of detergent falling on a greasy dish. At that time, I was a thousand times more afraid to live than to die. At the time of his trial, Sato was only 16 and couldn't be convicted because of his age. Therefore, after he was charged with murder, he was sent to a juvenile detention and reformatory center in Tokyo. Sato was said to be the poster child for hiki omore, a form of severe withdrawal from society. This leads people to seek extreme degrees of social isolation and confinement, following the pattern Sato seemed to display as he got older. On March 11, 2004, Sato, at just 21 years old, was released from the juvenile detention center with a new identity. The release was met with public criticism and outrage. Obviously, the public was pissed that he was released. I mean, I'm pissed that he's released. His movements and day-to-day -day are heavily monitored by investigators and police, but there have been numerous reports of him being spotted on the streets. Today, he is 40 years old, and according to reports, he is allegedly living in Adachiku, Tokyo, where he works as a mechanic worker and continues to be heavily monitored by police. All of these years later, there is still some controversy in this case, with many believing that Boy A was wrongly accused of these crimes. They continue to point some contradictions in the police investigation, like how one of the investigators said the killer was left-handed, but Boy A was right-handed. They also say that Boy A's confession contained many absurd statements and claims of things that would be impossible for a 14-year-old to do. What those are are very unclear. And lastly, they claim that Boy A had bad grades, yet in his confession, it was complex and contained many elaborate figures of speech. To me, this might play into Sato's complaints about hatred towards the educational system, as many kids who struggle in school do poorly, but are actually very smart and just apply themselves to do things outside of school since they don't see the point of school itself. While there will always be doubters, it is worth noting that Sato's mom visited him in prison and asked him point blank if he had really committed the crimes, to which he affirmed yes. I think he did it, and I think he should still be in jail. Given his diary of explicit events and the confession to his mother, it's hard to come up with a reason why he wouldn't be the killer, but for some, there will always be doubts. After the Kobe child murders, Japanese politician Shitsuka Kamai called for restricting objectionable content, stating movies lacking any literature or educational merit made for just showing cruel scenes. Adults should be blamed for this. The incident gives adults a chance to rethink the policy of self-imposed restrictions on these films and whether they should allow them just because they're profitable. In 2000, Japan lowered the age for criminal responsibility from 16 to 14. However, there have been some calls to revise this to a lower age, but as of now, it is 14. You could argue those around Sato could and should have seen this coming. Maybe a small part of them recognized the darkness but weren't quite sure what it was. But imagine thinking a child could commit such heinous acts. It's almost too absurd for our brains to even comprehend. Sato wrote in his book, If I had the incident while my grandmother was alive, it was at least a relief she passed before that happened. No matter what I do, I think my grandma loved me with all her heart. I can't bear the depths of her love. Grief, loneliness, and love can combine to become an auxiliar of darkness rooted in the need to control, numb, and taste. Maybe his grandmother's death was the catalyst that set him on the path to kill. We will never know. Or maybe he was born with a darkness that just consumed his soul. Whatever it was, we'll remember all those impacted by his darkness, especially the beautiful souls of June and Ikea who are forever alive in their family's hearts and memories. Please let me know in the comments what your thoughts and opinions are on this case. And don't forget to share your case suggestions so I know what you want to listen to and hear next. Please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or whatever podcast platform you're listening on. You can stay connected with me on Instagram and TikTok at this is Stephanie Moram. Until next time, stay safe out there.